This is a CBC Podcast. Danse, Anin, Bujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Warriors, adventurers, quacks, and murder? Those are some of the topics tackled in podcasts. As more and more Indigenous podcasters turn to audio storytelling to reclaim their voices and their stories. September 30th is International Podcast Day. To celebrate, Unreserved is tuning in to Indigenous podcasts. One podcast that the Unreserved team has really been into this summer is called This Land. Major Ridge and John Ridge, two generations of my family, were killed on the same day. They were assassinated for a choice they made. That decision brought our tribe to this land on the promise that it would be ours for as long as the waters run and the grass grows. But the United States didn't keep that promise. People might think these broken promises that are more than a century old don't matter today but they have everything to do with the present. Muskogee Creek citizen Patrick Murphy was convicted of murdering another Muskogee Creek citizen on tribal lands in 1999 and sentenced to death by a state court. That murder would force us to face our past and to decide whether it should determine the future. The podcast is hard to describe, but basically it's about a murder case in Oklahoma, now in front of the Supreme Court. The decision in that case could mean big changes for the Cherokee Nation. Rebecca Nagel is a Cherokee journalist and the host of the podcast. She joins me from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Now, first of all, the podcast covers a lot of ground. How do you describe it to people? I think the place where the podcast starts is a murder in the late 90s and the appeals case. And so the podcast tells the story of how that murder gets to the Supreme Court. Mm. Now, as you said, the center of the podcast is this case, the Carpenter versus Murphy case, which is in front of the Supreme Court. Can you explain a little bit about that particular case? Yeah, so what happened is that in 1999, a Muscogee Creek Nation citizen murdered another Muscogee Creek Nation citizen, and he was sentenced to death by the state of Oklahoma. And in his appeal case, appealing the death penalty, um, he argued that Oklahoma didn't have jurisdiction to convict him of that crime because it happened on a reservation and only tribes and the federal government have jurisdiction for crimes on a reservation. But Oklahoma says Muscogee Creek Nation's reservation no longer exists. And so this has been appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's the decision we're waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on. Basically, the central question is, did the U.S. government, did Congress in particular, ever abolish or take away the reservation of Muscogee Creek Nation? Now, this case could have bigger repercussions beyond the Muscogee Creek Nation. How will it impact other nations in Oklahoma? The reason that the case is bigger than just one tribe is that some of the acts of Congress um, that were passed to create the state of Oklahoma and impacted the land rights of our tribes were the exact same laws. And so if the Supreme Court interprets those laws to say, you know what, Muscogee Creek Nation, you no longer have a reservation, it would most likely apply to our tribe, to Cherokee Nation, and also Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole. Um, But the land that is um, in dispute is about half the state of Oklahoma and 19 million acres. So a lot is riding on this case. How did you get involved in the podcast? I wrote an opinion piece last November around the time that it went to the Supreme Court for the first oral arguments. 
And a media company uh, called Crooked Media read the op-ed and decided they wanted to turn it into a podcast series. So um, a kind of unexpected um, for me, but I think it's been an excellent way to raise awareness about this case. You know, I think outside of Oklahoma and outside of Indian country and native media, not a lot of people were talking about this case. A lot of people weren't even aware that it was going on. And so through the podcast, we've really been able to educate people about what at stake and the history of how we got here. Mm. Now, as you said, you're awaiting that uh, decision. But a big twist here <laughs> is the Supreme Court has decided to postpone it on uh, on this case until next year. What was your reaction when you heard that? Um, shock and dismay. I think, mm. um, you know, obviously I was hoping for a good outcome and there were different ways the case could have gone. One of the justices has recused himself. So there's actually a possibility of a tie, a 4-4 decision. So all of those different possibilities were things that I had anticipated and thought about happening and a postponement was something I frankly just did not see coming and a lot of other people who not only follow this case in particular but were following the supreme court this term were also surprised by that outcome it's very 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 rare for the supreme court to postpone a decision and usually it happens when maybe you know a Mm. new supreme like a new justice has been added to the court and they weren't there for oral arguments or things like that you know we'll see what happens the case will be re-argued which means like both sides will get up in front of the justices again and make their arguments and answer questions. And so there may be some clues when that happens as to like what was unresolved, what questions did the justices still want to have answered. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it was a surprise move. It was something that not a lot of people saw coming. And because of the way that the Supreme Court is just an opaque institution and they don't share their reasons why, Chief Justice Roberts literally just said one sentence about the case (laughs) and the postponement, um, we'll, you know, just have to wait and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, basing a podcast on an event that's unfolding um, as you're recording it certainly brings an inherent risk, as it were. Is that part of um, what attracts listeners to this land? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we had planned to report on a decision and not a postponement. So it did throw things up into the air just from a storytelling perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I'm proud about with the podcast is that I think before we started telling the story, not a lot of people were paying attention to this case. And that's pretty common when it comes to treaty cases, treaty rights. You know, we just don't get a lot of mainstream coverage of our issues. And when those battles are taking place in that vacuum, I think it's much easier for there to be a lack of accountability, you know, and for the law um, to not be followed. So I think more eyes and ears on this case is a good thing. And, um, you know, hopefully listeners will stick through with us through the next term. Mm. Now, as a Cherokee journalist, why was it important for you to share this story with the world? For me, the land that's in dispute in this case, you know, and the arguments that Oklahoma is making, um, you know, that our tribes haven't had reservations and haven't had the right to our treaty land um, since Oklahoma became a state is basically what they're saying. That argument is very personal to me because the land that's in dispute for Cherokee Nation is the land that my ancestors signed the treaty for. So uh, my family members signed Cherokee Nation's removal treaty, the treaty of New Echota. Um, it's a controversial treaty in Cherokee history. It's still controversial today. At the time, they were considered traitors. They were actually assassinated for their decision to do that. Um, so they made a lot of personal sacrifices. My belief is that they were trying to do the best that they could to preserve a future for Cherokee Nation and to preserve Cherokee sovereignty. So basically, that huge sacrifice that my ancestors made for, you know, over the past century, Oklahoma has said that it's for not. And besides a small piece of allotted land um, that's still what's considered restricted, according to Oklahoma, um, the overwhelming majority of the 14 county jurisdiction uh, within Cherokee Nation is not Indian country or is not considered Indian land. And this decision could change that, you know, and for the first time in over a century, the land that my ancestors died for um, could be acknowledged for what it is, um, could be acknowledged. Which is Cherokee land. 
Now, we're seeing more and more Indigenous podcasts out in the world. What do you think uh, Indigenous people bring to the podcast world? I hope that we're just the cusp and the beginning of Indigenous podcasting and, you know, being able to, like, put Indigenous voices in my earbuds <laughs> as I'm going around the world. Um, in general, you know, there are some scary and sad statistics, you know, Native stories are a fraction of 1% of all the media stories and content that's out there in the world when it comes to people who have jobs working at, you know, newspaper outlets or television stations, we're again, a fraction of 1% of people represented in the news industry. And, you know, I think what happens over and over again is when our issues aren't covered and we're not seen as contemporary and real people. And we live in a country where lawmakers have a profound impact on the rights of our tribes and our rights as tribal citizens. But that country, the public and lawmakers often themselves don't understand thing one about tribes. It makes fighting for native rights an almost impossible battle. You know, it's a really uphill climb where every step of the way, there's so much educating that we have to do. Us telling our stories, especially in a country and at a time where there are almost none, where there's such a lack of that, is really important for advancing structural change. And if we're going to get an accurate story in the mainstream media, I think that it needs to be coming from Indigenous voices. Well, thank you for uh, sharing that with us and spending some time with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. That was Rebecca Nagel, who is a Cherokee journalist and the host of the podcast, This Land, by Crooked Media. You can listen to the entire season of This Land right now on your favorite podcast app. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. Talking all about podcasts on the show today. And one trend you've probably noticed in the podcast world is an interest in true crime stories. Well, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's entry into that space is called Blood on the Tracks. A million questions, why, how, who, what. A country police investigation overshadowed by the politics of race. You know how it is. Young Aboriginal men, they just walk away, lie down on railway tracks and wait to get hit by a freight train. That's actually their answer. That was their story, you know what I mean? But it wasn't our story. That was a bit of Blood on the Tracks. I'll tell you more about that podcast a little later on the show. And remember, we have a handy list of all the podcasts we're featuring today. You can find it at cbc.ca slash unreserved. You're listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Tuning in to some notable Indigenous podcasts on the show today, like this one. Hi, everybody. My name is Jana Schmeeding. I am a Minikanju and Shichangu Lakota comedy writer and performer living in Tongva Territory, a.k.a. Los Angeles. I host and produce a podcast on the Hoo Ha Network called Woman of Size that you can find on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. On my podcast, I'm exploring the many ways that our bodies and lives have been stigmatized for being fat, black, brown, indigenous, queer, gender non-binary, and or disabled. I do this by interviewing people who move through the world with marginalized bodies, listening to their experiences, and hopefully illuminating the individual behind the stigma. In this clip that I'm sharing with you, I'm interviewing Trisha Rainwater Tutwiler, a Choctaw and Digiqueer multimedia artist living in the Bay Area, as she talks about how colonialism has impacted the way she sees herself and the way she treats her body. Pilama Yaye, thank you and enjoy. How do you think that it um, colonialism has impacted, like, your, the view of your own body, and but also the experiences that you've had. Yeah, so being raised by, um, I mean, part of my life I was raised by white folks, and my mother's parents, who are really angry with her choice of partner, <laughs> my father, um, and they really took that out on me as an 
great kid in the family, the Sam like staunch German Republicans um, on a cattle ranch in oh Northern boy. California. And we're very angry. So when I would come back from ceremony or <laughs> powwow, they were they were really cruel. And so it really formed me like looking for, you know, just constant me comparing myself to people and needing people to see me and accept me. And that led me to like so many bad relationships. Oh my <laughs> you know, God. Kind Same. Of leads, you, leads you into looking at your body as a prop and not treating your body kindly. The body that we got. That was Jana Schmieding, host of Woman of Size. She was in conversation with Choctaw artist Trisha Jameson Rainwater. If you want to hear more from Woman of Size or any of the pods we're featuring on the show today, head over to our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, celebrating International Podcast Day on the show this week. Radio check. Anybody copy? Hey, folks, I'm Alice Cunny Glenn, and this is Coffee and Clock. Coffee and Clock is a weekly podcast I created to celebrate and explore contemporary Native life in urban Alaska. From cultural appropriation to traditional tattoos to decolonization... No topic is off limits for Coffee and Quok, a new podcast produced out of Alaska. Host and producer Alice Glenn is a Nupiak and lives in Anchorage. She joins me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Koya Nakbuk. I don't have any coffee for you, but... Uh, <laughs> That's before... okay. I brought my own. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Before our listeners who might not know what Quok is, can you explain what that means? Yes, so quok is the Inupiaq word for frozen or raw meat or fish, and it's also a verb to to eat frozen or raw meat or fish. Ah, huh. and why did you choose that for the name of your podcast? So coffee I kind of use to represent keeping us woke. Um, I try to cover these current event topics happening now, so I kind of use it as a way to like keep the Native kids woke. And then quok to examine our topics through an Alaska Native lens. So kind of both sides of this um, Western um, culture and then our Indigenous culture. So why did you want to make this podcast? Honestly, it just came from a gap in this media. Um, I wasn't seeing any Alaska Native focus, at least compelling media, something that I would want to listen to, like on the radio or online or anything I went to school down south, and I, you know, was definitely missing my culture, my home, my food, uh, my people. And so when I moved back, it just was like a reawakening and a reconnection with friends, family, and culture. And it kind of surprised me that there, although you know we've been here for thousands of years in our state, we still weren't being seen in mainstream media, especially from a young Native contemporary view. There's so many beautiful parts to us. And if you're just defining us by some of these problems that we're struggling with, then you'll, you won't see the beauty. So I just really wanted to make sure to highlight that and share that truth. I really just wanted to disrupt that narrative in the news that were, you know, defined by alcoholism or suicide or those, you know, some of these things that we're struggling with. So that's why I created Coffee and Clock. Hmm. And why did you think a podcast was the best way to fill that gap? I had never started a podcast. I had no experience in it. I, I had listened to a very few up until then. I didn't even really know what a podcast was, but it seemed achievable. Anyone with a smartphone and a computer can create a podcast um, themselves if they want to. And so it, it seemed like I can do that. You know, it seemed attainable. And also, I just like I'm a naturally curious person. I was kind of sitting around meeting young Alaska Native people here in town, uh, like at a restaurant, at a bar. I would meet all of these amazing people doing great things. And I would honestly have these conversations with them. But I would always leave and think like, man, I should have recorded that. And you don't have a background in podcasting at all. Oh, no, no. So this is a big experimental time in my life, really. I, I 
I'm trained. I went to school for aerospace. I attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in uh, Arizona and also Florida, which are probably like the most opposite ends, you know, from coming from the northernmost village in Alaska to the hottest states probably in, in the U.S. But I, I came back. I was missing my family and, and culture, like I said, and just kind of saw my state with new eyes. I just kind of took it upon myself <laughs> to create it, I guess. Yeah, well, you got to be fearless about these things, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and now you're seven episodes in, and you've covered a bunch of topics, including cultural appropriation, experiences of LGBTQ people in Indigenous communities. And you've even had an episode on what's the preferred terminology, Eskimo or Inuit. What can people expect to hear in future episodes? The next episode is called Raised in the Village, exploring the non-Native experience growing up in these in rural communities, which are, you know, majority Native communities. Um, so what does that experience look like as a, kind of a minority, you know, living in a Native community? After that, I have Alaska Native Men's Health and Wellness. There's a lot of work that's being done by some people in men's circles, um, yeah, I, I definitely want to do something on missing and murdered Indigenous women because we have that here as well in Alaska. Yeah, so I've got like 15 other uh, ideas <laughs> in various stages of preparation. Um, and I'm just so excited to continue working and sharing those with everyone. Hmm. So no shortage of material, that's for sure. Um, oh, no. Yeah, we're seeing more and more Indigenous podcasts um, coming up across Turtle Island. Why do you think it's important for Indigenous people to share their voice in this way? I think it's so important because, um, like I said, with just with the news media, you know, a lot of people, even in our own state, they don't understand the Alaska Native experience. So our stories are being told, you know, from this tunnel view of, you know, one part of who we are rather than this holistic and bigger approach to who we are. And only we as Native people know the intricacies and the complexities and the beautiful parts of our culture enough to share. And I think that if we don't have that representation, if we don't have people like us who understand and know our the way that we grew up and our experiences as Native people share those stories, it's just not going to be accurate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Alice Glenn is the host and producer of Coffee and Quok, a podcast on Inuit life in urban Alaska. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Talking all about podcasts on the show today, you can find links to all the podcasts we're sampling on our site at cbc.ca slash unreserved. And did you know that we have a podcast? Well, yes, yes, we do. And if you subscribe, you can listen to this show anytime, anywhere. But you also get bonus features like our Indigenous language podcast called First Words. In our most recent episode, Amazing Race Canada winners James McCocus and Anthony Johnson share how they used language on their time on the reality show and why it's so important. Here's a bit of that. Our team name is Team Agamemuk, which refers to many people not giving up and uh, persevering and continuing in the face of adversity and at any challenge and at any cost where you think you're not going to be able to go through it. Agamemuk is a singular, you would refer to one person. Agamemuk is referring to many people. And... Uh, for me in particular, um, this was so important because when I was in medical school and university, because I was in school for 13 years, and it got really tough because of just the academic rigor of things or, you know, working a 36-hour shift as a resident physician or experiencing racism. And we wanted to give up that my family would bring us home you know, even if it was for a weekend, and arrange a ceremony for us, whether that was a mahtotsan. Mahto in Cree means to cry. Mahtotsan is the crying lodge or the sweat lodge where we go to help ourselves be connected with Gikawi no Aski, Mother Earth. It's like a womb to be connected with that again. And there's many teachings in that. But um, they would arrange for that. And our elders, when we'd go home, they'd be like, Agamemok nosim. Don't give up my grandchild. And they, w- <laughs> they would be so encouraging 
for for me and my sister. And so being on the mat and and winning <laughs> was a win for them and it was a win for many people across the country, many indigenous people. And it was a win for my grandparents and grandmothers and cookums and wissums who have taught me many things about how to be a good nehio, a good person. But Anthony actually came up with the name. <laughs> <laughs> that was from our First Words podcast. You can hear more by heading over to cbc.ca slash podcasting or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to Unreserved. <laughs> This is Unreserved. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, and we're checking out some new podcasts to add to your libraries as we celebrate International Podcast Day. Up next, we're heading south, very south, all the way to Australia. Unravel is a podcast from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The first season is called Blood on the Tracks, and it's hosted by award-winning journalist Alan Clark. Alan is more Huari, and the podcast follows him as he investigates the unsolved death of an Indigenous man named Mark Haynes. I've spent the past five years investigating the suspicious death of Aboriginal teenager Mark Haynes in Tamworth back in 1988, and I think I'm close to finding some answers. They said there's been an accident. Mark's been found on railway tracks. Just outside Tamworth, a 17-year-old Aboriginal boy is dead. I just said, oh, Mark, <laughs> it just broke me. I, uh, I cried. Uh, not Mark. Why Mark? Not Mark. He was gone. Is it suicide? Misadventure? or something more sinister. Well, what we didn't see was any blood. And under his head there was a towel, it was a white towel. And we picked up a comb and a pink cigarette lighter. And that's why I said, no, I'm sorry, you could not drive a car. No way. The, the jigsaw puzzles didn't fit. A million questions, why, how, who, what. A country police investigation overshadowed by the politics of race. You know how it is. Young Aboriginal men, they just walk away, lie down on railway tracks and wait to get hit by a freight train. That's actually their answer. That was their story, you know what I mean? But it wasn't our story. A family on a 30-year fight for justice. So I just done what any uh, family would do for their loved ones. Question what was happening. It was foul play, and it was a cover-up, right from the word go. I said, well, where was you? Where was you when uh, my nephew was found dead? I'll fight every one of you fools, one at a time or all at once, I don't care. We don't call ourselves vigilantes. We're here in search of the truth, and still are. He hasn't given up. 30 years later, I just wish, I just wish he'd fight He'd get his answers. I just want him to have peace. I want Mark to have peace. So I'll just ask you one last time. Did you have anything to do with Mark's death? That was a clip from season one of the ABC podcast Unravel, Blood on the Tracks. It's hosted by Muhuari journalist Alan Clark. Alan's investigation into the death of Mark Haynes led to the case being reopened. If you want to hear more from this podcast or any of the pods we're featuring on the show today, head over to our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Since we're talking about podcasts on the show this week, I thought I'd uh, head over for a chat with Lindsay Michael. She's one of the co-hosts of Podcast Playlist here on CBC, and this woman listens to a lot of podcasts and knows her 
odds. <laughs> Hello, Lindsay. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. So we did a show on Indigenous produced podcasts last year for International Podcast Day, and there are quite a few podcasts to choose from. But this year, there seems to be so many more. Yeah. Why do you think we're seeing more Indigenous podcasters stepping up to that microphone? I mean, I think we're seeing more podcasters in general, but I also think we're seeing a lot of podcasters who maybe haven't been represented in the media enough because I think in podcasting, it's not like film or television where you need a ton of money or you need uh, institutional support to do it. Like you can make your own podcast if you know people who are talented or if you have, you know, know how to work audio. And so I think a lot of people are just making their own podcasts. And a lot of the best Indigenous podcasts that I have heard are independent. And there's so many of them. So mm -hmm. it's exciting to hear them. And also the other cool thing about podcasting is it's an easy way to reach an audience that might be scattered all over the place who are interested in one specific thing. So my favorite example of like how specific podcasts can get is there's a podcast called The Orlando Mall Guide, which just talks about malls in Orlando. <laughs> you know, so anyway, but I feel like that is a way to like reach a community that's maybe just beyond your town. Mm -hmm. Now, just like you do on your show, you're going to introduce unreserved listeners to a podcast that you think they might like. Yeah. What do you, what do you got in mind for us today? Okay, so I'm really excited for this one. Phelan Johnson from The Secret Life of Canada actually introduced this one to me, and I love it. It's called All My Relations, and it features two Indigenous women, Matika Wilbur, who is a visual storyteller from the Swinomish and Tulalip peoples from coastal Washington, and Adrienne Keene, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and she's the creator and author of a blog that discusses cultural appropriation stereotypes. But, like, what I love about this podcast is the way they talk to each other. It's very, like, casual and friendly, but also within that comfort, there's so much um, really interesting information and intellectual layers. You can listen to it and feel like you're hanging out with your friends, having, like, a super smart conversation with a glass of wine kind of thing. It focuses on, like, relationships to land, identity, and to each other. Uh, they talk about Indigenous feminism and food sovereignty. And I actually have a clip for you so you get a sense of it. All right. So this is a clip from the first episode. And in it, we're just kind of really getting to know the hosts. And here, Matika Wilbur talks about her past work as a fashion photographer and how she shifted her focus into capturing Indigenous subjects. I studied photography in school and advertising. And I, I did like we all do when we go through a commercial program. I uh, was trained to become a photographer that makes money. And I remember distinctly remember one of my professors saying to me, well, if you want to make money, you should photograph more white people because you need skinny white women, a lot of them in your portfolio if you want to work. That's what I did. And so when I graduated from college, I had this I had this portfolio of really uh really skinny white women, essentially. <laughs> and, and then I went to Los Angeles and I started working in advertising and celebrity photography. And, and I remember this one day I was getting off on Sunset in La Brea and I looked up at this, at this ad that I had created. And it was this woman who, when we photographed her, was crying on set because she was so hungry. And I was like, girl, it's not a big deal. I'll get you some carrots. You know, like we have beautiful catering. And she was like, oh, no, I don't. I don't eat. I don't eat before photo shoots. And I, and I just remember thinking, like, I can't believe I'm participating in this. And then I looked up at the ad a couple of months later and it said, live the life you've always wanted. And I immediately quit my job. And I did like you're supposed to do when you're having a sort of uh, existential early life crisis. I went to South America. <laughs> and I traveled around. I got to meet a lot of really great indigenous people photographing them. And, and it was there when I was there working with indigenous folks that I had this realization that I hadn't even photographed my own people. That was Adrian Keene and Matika Wilbur's podcast, All My Relations, a podcast pick from podcast playlist host Lindsay Michael. It is rather engaging, isn't it? You just want to, you just want to be there. Oh Pass yeah, the wine, you know. I know, and what's great about it is they get into like really interesting discussions. Like later in this episode, they start talking about feminism and how uh, they feel as Indigenous women. It 
they don't feel included in it and how every time they say that people get so upset. And it's just fascinating to to listen to. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for uh, bringing our attention to it. I'm going to go listen to it now. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) That was Lindsay Michael, co-host of CBC's podcast show, Podcast Playlist. Her podcast pick was All My Relations. Remember, you can find links to all the pods we're talking about on the show today on our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. And speaking of podcasts, here's one that bills itself as a podcast about science and Indian stuff. Welcome to the Indian Science Show. I'm Annie. And I'm Turtle. And this is a podcast where we bring different worldviews together into conversations about science in Indian country. And here's a clip from an interview we did with Robin Kimmer. Enjoy. We'd like to give you an opportunity to tell a little bit about your story and where you come from. So can you share maybe a story from your childhood or uh, maybe your, one of your favorite memories growing up here in New York? Sure. A uh, favorite memory. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in the woods and fields. I was kind of a free-range kid. And so a lot of my very favorite memories are of simply being outside with plants. Yes, I was that plant geek <laughs> from the time I was a little kid. And um, so a favorite memory, you know, to, there were these beautiful old fields that, that grew um, um, strawberries and goldenrod and asters and willows and little baby orchids in the grass. It was, it was magical growing up. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the memories that comes to me in particular is the first time that I wanted to make a basket. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have anybody to teach me that because I grew mm. up away from our people. Um, and so I said, well... I'm going to figure this out. And I went and I cut willows by the stream and I soaked them. And um, I just remember the magic of having that confidence that the plants would show me what to do. Um, and mm-hmm. and just the, the sheer... Um, joy of of trying to figure it out i have to tell you i mean my first basket looked pretty terrible <laughs> <laughs> looked like an eight-year-old made it right. how about that um, but i so profoundly remember that sense of saying well the plants will show me how to do this mm-hmm. and uh and the plants have been good teachers to me ever since that moment That was a bit of the Indian Science Show. You can hear more by finding a link to that podcast on our site at cbc.ca slash unreserved. Have you met Molly of Denali yet? Let's go! Molly of Denali She's Molly of Denali Come on! Let's go! That's the catchy theme music for this kid's podcast that follows Molly, an almost 10-year-old Gwich'in and Koyakon girl from Denali in Alaska. She's joined by her best friend, Tui, and her dog, Suki, and the adventures they get up to are anything but ordinary. 14-year-old Sovereign Bill voices Molly. So Molly is very adventurous, and she always just wants to learn more, and sometimes her fantastic ideas don't quite work out, but then she just goes on and still keeps working, and she's just very persistent. The podcast has been a huge hit, so much so that it's been turned into a TV cartoon show. Sovereign, who is Tlingit and Muckleshoot, grew up with her Indigenous identity at the forefront. But before Molly of Denali, she said, she hadn't seen much kids' content. Yeah, we didn't grow up watching shows like this, and um, of course there was like Peter Pan and different cartoons like that, but um, we were actually allowed in our house to watch those. Seeing yourself, seeing your culture being portrayed in an untrue manner, it can really lose out in your cultural identity. A team of cultural advisors tries to make the show as accurate to Northern living as possible. With cast members from all walks of Indigenous life, having cultural advisors is even more important. And the chance to be part of it all, Sovereign says, is something that's near and dear to her. Just something I'm very proud of, being able to do this, being able to 
have my contribution in this great work. And we haven't had this representation for a very long time or never. And um, so it's a good representation. And it's breaking the stereotype. That's Sovereign Bill, star of the Molly of Denali podcast, which has also been turned into a TV cartoon show. It airs Saturdays at 10 a.m. on CBC and anytime on CBC Gem. And the podcast is available everywhere you get your podcasts. A life activist with an Afro-spiritualist twist and a stand in her power, Anishinaabe woman claim their spaces. This is Medicine for the Resistance. Patty Crawack, Anishinaabe Kwe from Lac Sewell First Nation, and Carrie Goring, a love and relationship coach, take you through conversations and interviews through a black and indigenous lens. Crawack says when the two met, they knew their common experiences would resonate with their audience. I met Carrie, and together we decided that there's a lot of common ground with Black and Indigenous people. We have experienced a lot of the same nonsense from settler colonialism and white supremacy, and we decided to do this podcast so that we can help other people who are struggling against this, and we can help them push back. Medicine for the Resistance speaks with authors, artists, elders, and writers about various contemporary issues facing Black and Indigenous peoples today. We have a great clip for you to listen to. This was recorded live at Short Hills in the the Niagara region. Every year there is a hunt where the Indigenous hunters are able to come into a provincial park and harvest some of the deer, and a protest has arisen as a result of that. And so this clip that you're about to hear is my son talking about his own experiences living with the plant and animal nations as being part of part of a community, part of a web of relationships in which we all rely on each other, not just human, but also non-human relatives. So we hope you listen to our podcast. We hope you really like it because Carrie and I really enjoy bringing it to you. It is in the right spirit, and I hope you share it with us. Yes. This kind of started learning how to nibble on what was around. Um, I started trying to learn how to do so in a way that it actually impacted my food bill. But then in order to do so responsibly and ethically, you know, you have to start looking at, all right, so what's, what's the life cycle of this plant look like? What density of stems per square foot do I need this plant to be in order for me to harvest enough to get a meal without impacting its ability to come back? Um, actually, Robin Kimmerer um, actually mentioned in braiding sweetgrass about how some plants actually uh, grow better when they're harvested on a regular basis. Which, which, of these, which of these plants grow better when they're harvested frequently? How do I incorporate them into my diet? That was Ben Crawick, Patty's oldest son, speaking in the clip. That episode is about food autonomy. It'll be out in November. Hey-ya! Welcome back, warriors. Tansei, Sego, Ani Buju. Queen Deluisi Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. She is known for her outspoken activism and advocacy work. She's written about Indigenous identity, nationhood, and the debate over genocide in Canada. But this Mi'kmaq lawyer from Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick is not the focus of this podcast. The Warrior Life focuses on Indigenous peoples living, well, the warrior life. From advocates and land protectors to actors and chefs, Pam Pometer is pulling together perspectives from across Turtle Island. Pam is an associate professor and chair in Indigenous governance in the Department of Politics and Public Administration and heads the Center for Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. Welcome to Unreserved, Pam. Thanks for having me. So with all the stuff that you already do, why did you want to create this podcast? Well, my sons are kind of my social media experts, and (laughs) it was my eldest son, Mitchell, who said, you know, Mom, I am, whenever I work out at the gym, all I do is listen to podcasts. When I drive to and from work, I listen to podcasts. And, you know, when we're hanging out on the weekend, my friends and I are listening to podcasts, and you're missing an entire group of people who engage mostly through podcasts. And I thought, wow, you know, I never thought about that. Mm. But for me, I didn't want to just copy the same material that I have on YouTube or on my Twitter or Instagram or any of the other things I do, like my blog. So I had to really give some thought about how could I engage with the younger generation on podcasts in a different way. Mm -hmm. And what was that different way that you finally settled upon? 
Well, I thought, you know, it was this concept of, of the warrior life. I do a lot of public speaking, and I do a lot of work in First Nations communities, and I engage with a lot of people, and I was always getting asked, you know, questions about, you know, I wish I could be someone like Cindy Blackstock or Cora Morgan or, you know, Tantu Cardinal, all these people that we look up to. And my response to them was always, well, you can be. Well, you know, we can all live this, you know, warrior life where we live a good life and defend our people and our lands and our territories, but we don't all have to do it in the same way. And so I wanted to find a way to reach all these younger people where they're at and help them see that they can, you know, be a warrior, they can live a good life in a multitude of ways. There's not just one way to do it. Mm. The description for The Warrior Life reads, uh, this podcast is about living a warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits through education, health, and community. What does decolonizing mean to you? Well, that's the key here, because... For me, and I use myself as an example, you know, I've been focusing on decolonization, which is about, you know, resisting assimilation, resisting racism, resisting oppression by governments in our territories, uh, protecting our lands and all of those things. But that's just one aspect of decolonizing. We also have to try to figure out a way to identify all the things that are in our minds or in our brains that were implanted there by the colonizers, you know, capitalist ways of thinking or think focusing exclusively on individuals and forgetting about our collectives. And that's, that's a hard process. These are things that we actually have to work on in practice. They're not just like academic theoretical ideas, mm-hmm. but it also... Think about decolonizing our diets, you know, making sure that we're not eating sugar and pop and chips as our diets um, and focusing back more on our traditional diets, you know, country food, which was about, you know, protein and carbs and, and fruit and vegetables and, you know, physical activity. So that's when I'm talking about decolonization, it's all of it, you know, mm. our physical activity, our nutrition, our ceremony. Um, reconnecting with our elders, all of that, um, our languages and our practices, as well as the political side of things. That's quite an unraveling of, you know, this this thought process is is decolonization. What are the reactions when you point out history and, and context like that? Well, sometimes it's a bit jarring because, you know, we all have beliefs, you know, we've been, we've grown up in different ways and, um, being challenged on some of these things to just think about it or unpackage it a little bit, unravel it a little bit. Sometimes it's a bit jarring. Many people, they need to, you know, go away and think about that for a while, talk to other people. But for some, they get it right away. Like, wow, I just never thought of that. Mm. The Mind blown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's magical. Yeah. That's how we start identifying the colonizer in our head, decolonizing our mind. Wow. And what do you hope people will take with them from listening to The Warrior Life? Well, what I hope is that they will see their own past. That sometimes we look at people and say, look, they're so famous, like Cindy Blackstock. She's so famous. She's doing such amazing work. She's all over the world, you know, defending the rights of First Nation kids in care. There's no way I could do that because of, you know, lots of reasons. I don't have any money to travel or I don't have that kind of education background or, you know, there's lots of reasons why people think they can't do things. But if you look at the multitude of people that I talk to on this podcast, they talk about what it means to be a warrior in a whole bunch of different ways, like Kennehost Manual. She's well known as one of those warriors on the ground defending her territory. But she says first and foremost, being a warrior is being a good mom Mm. and taking care of her kids and teaching them their language and culture and practices. So we, we need to provide a place where people can see where they can fit into the warrior life and be living a good life for themselves, their kids, and in, in a multitude of ways. Mm, what a beautiful message. And, of course, none of those people didn't, you know, thought that they could do either, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and the thing is, is when they share all their stories, they say, none of this stuff was easy. Mm. It was hard. And it might look glamorous in the media or on TV, but, in fact, it's a lot of hard work and learning, and we're all doing it together. Mm. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time today, Pam. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan. Aw.
Back at you, dream catcher. <laughs> <laughs> I read that on a meme. That's not mine. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's Pam Palmer, host of the Warrior Life podcast. You can find a link to it on our site at cbc.ca slash unreserved. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say... For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.